All right, is that good? No. All see. right, I need a thumbs up that we're sharing. Let me when you can see it. All right, yeah, cool. Thank you. Oh, awesome. Um, so we're friends of the whole Phoebe organization, and and when Christina asked us to um, speak, uh, we were never hesitant because we didn't want to support. We're a little hesitant because it takes a little time to to think about what you're up to and and put that together and and try to give value to somebody. So Christina, nothing personal. If we if we floundered a little bit, getting back to you. Um, I'm going to move the picture of you guys over here so I don't look away as much. And I swear I'll be, I'm almost there. Give me just a second. Ooh, that works. <laughs> there you go. All right. So um, tonight we're going to talk about how we've improved some of the rentals we have. And if you don't have rentals, Hopefully there's still some lessons in here that'll make sense for you and you can apply to your life because you're gonna, it, it, it's, if you're a flipper or a wholesaler, I can tell you a lesson I've learned is you're never going to meet an old rich flipper. You don't meet all rich guys who say, oh, I flipped properties. I flipped a hundred a year. The old rich people you meet are the people that kept houses. It's the guys who have rentals. So that's been a goal for us all along ever since we started is to keep as much as we can, but we've been flipping because that's our job. That's how we make chunks of money. That's how we pay our bills, at least initially. And eventually it flips and your rentals pay your bills. So let's jump into it. Two rentals, a flip and an ADU. All right, let's see if my slides advance like I want them to. All right, so the roster. This story involves three different houses. So the roster is the three houses. So first I'm gonna introduce the houses. We're building our team, our first house. Our first house is called Sun Gold. It's a three bed, one bath. It's, I'm probably yelling at you, I'm so excited. I need to, Janet, so you don't need to yell. <laughs> Sorry. So the facts about Sun Gold, it's a three bed, one bath. It's a 1,060 square feet. We paid about 100 grand for this in 2015. So we've had this house for five years. And when we bought it, it was worth about 135. And the rents have been up a little bit, but it rents for about 1400 bucks, a little less than $1,400. And when we bought it, we borrowed 110000 to buy it. With private financing. With private financing at 6%. Do you want to try to move that over there? Mm -hmm. I don't keep going. Let me keep going. So that's player number one. Okay. Player number two. Oh, so scorecard. So I want to keep a scorecard. We're going to... I'm gonna keep a scorecard of the different houses and how they come together in our story. So this is the first time we're gonna see the scorecard. So we paid hundred grand. This is the same number we just went over. Real quick, I wanna give a feel for you. We're gonna talk about three different properties and how they're all different kinds of properties, but how we brought them all together in one big pot to create a, a brand new scenario for us. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on yeah. why we have three properties. So you'll, you'll, we'll mention a lot of different techniques, but you'll see how we use them in action. So scorecard, one house, and there's the value of that one house. All right, player number two, this one's um, on Whitewater. It's a three bed, two bath, 1760 square feet, built in 1977, nicer house. It's a better neighborhood too. All right, Whitewater, we paid 250,000 bucks for just lately. And we really got a wonderful deal on this. At the time, we might've been able to sell it for about 380, 385. It rents for about 1700 bucks. And we bought it with 280,000 bucks of private financing. So we borrow, you might have noticed a pattern. On the first one, we borrowed 10,000 more than we paid. On this one, we borrowed 30,000 more than we paid. And that's mainly due to, it's 100% due to the private lending relationships we've developed over the years. Right, and we, we will always borrow the rehab costs. So that, that 385 included approximately 35 of rehab costs. All right. So what do we got going? So why did we buy Whitewater? Um, we like the idea of keeping it as a rental if possible. We like the neighborhood, it's a great neighborhood. And it was a lot newer house than, than the Sun Gold house, the first one. Sun Gold was built in 1952. So this thing was a good 20 some years newer, 25, 26 years newer. So we like that. Oh, you know what, you guys? I, wanted, I want to, um, I'll do the best I can to answer your questions via chat. So chat right, questions right at us while we're talking. And Jan is going to help me look at the chat window from time to time. And oh, see, good. Somebody, Brian, Brian, you already asked Janet, are those rents based as leases or as Airbnbs? So great question. 
all long-term leases. We yeah. do not Airbnb anything. Yeah. So 100%. Keep, don't worry about you guys asking questions like that. So now we're bringing our scorecard up again. We got our player number one, this little junky house in Sun Gold. Player number two, the one we like better, Whitewater. And so our scorecard for the first two houses, if you combine the values, we paid 350,000 for both those houses and they bring in about 3,000 bucks a month. We borrowed 390,000, but based on us getting a good deal, because that's what our job is, is to find a good discount house. We had about 100, 125 in equity compared to fair market value on those two houses. All right, that makes sense. Let's move on. Click on here, will ya? All right. And then finally, the third player in the game is Green Horse. Green Horse is a two bed, two bath, 1,400 square feet. So I want to see if you guys notice anything different from this house compared to the other houses. Oh, I guess you can draw with this. We didn't mess with me to draw. <laughs> All right. Uh, Nick says double wide. Okay, anything else? No lawn. Okay, great. Yep, Stacy. Definitely no lawn. What I was thinking the correct answer is this house lives in a neighborhood with clouds and the other two houses there's no clouds in those neighborhoods you'll see those pictures later and see what i'm talking about i think that's kind of my dumb sense of humor so mm -hmm. hopefully it doesn't it you guys find that interesting all right back on track so this one we paid 155,000. this is these are very recent this year and the fair market value we thought after we fixed it would be about 190. Rents I have down as zero, or Janet has down as zero. She helped me with this. And we have it down as zero. Why do, why do we have it down as zero? We have it down as zero because this neighborhood is not a good rental neighborhood. And we'll talk about why in just a bit. The debt, 140K when we bought it. And I'll tell you about that a little bit. That's this well kind of means we're going to tell you a little bit more about that in, in a minute. And we sourced it with a prior relationship. Now, I don't know if you saw in the first two players, the little junkie house on Sun Gold, and then the uh, Good neighborhood house called Whitewater. Those had a source down here, and I didn't tell you guys. The first one we sourced with a mailer, just a regular old I buy houses mailer. And the owner of that called me and said, Well, I want to sell my house. The second one, the one that I like, the one that in a nicer neighborhood, we sourced with an agent that we'd done a deal with before. And she called and said, I got a house for you. And luckily, we purchased two or three houses from her in the past. And so she knew we performed. And so we were rewarded for keeping a good relationship with an agent that does business. And this one, we actually happened to know the owner of this one and we had lost contact. And so this one is kind of a prior relationship and a mailer. She happened to receive one of our We Buy Houses mailers and she remembered us and called us up and said, hey, I have a house I wanna sell you. So that's how we found these deals. Um, so no, we didn't rehab this one yet we'll talk about it and so these um stacy all of these homes are in the coachella valley where we work that's where we specialize jen and i are coachella valley specialists and the coachella valley has 11 cities in it and i'm going to list those cities near the end of our presentation so you can see the cities we enjoy working at all right let's move on so we introduced our three players right why do we buy this one this last one over here Give me a minute, patience, and we'll get to that part of the story. All right, so our roster is full. We got three houses, right? The stadium. So the stadium, the stadium is what I'm calling today's investment environment in our market. So you have a stadium, wherever your market is. For Kurt, it's Oregon and whatever Kurt what's that other area you like to work in the other one and well for rentals or for flips well exactly wherever you have two stadiums and doesn't matter what you're doing there I do my so, flips right? in Southern California so yeah okay it makes sense but you do you work in Oregon too right so there's a state there that's kind of your environment you understand that environment you know what things refi for and you know what to do there yeah so our stadium, which means our investment market right now, and I think most of you guys are going to relate to this, is house prices are really high. 
off the shelf cash flow rentals, they're extinct. They used to exist in the Coachella Valley about three or four years ago, maybe five years ago, where you could actually find in the MLS a house you could buy at full asking price and get it to cash flow. Now the cash flow might've been really tiny, but they did exist. So they're mostly gone in, in all of the high deserts, low deserts, and Antelope Valleys, all of the outer lying LA areas. And those are the areas I'm gonna tell you folks that's, if you wanna do these types of deals, you go look for LA, um, outer lying areas in Southern California. Right now, also in our stadium, and this really applies to everybody in coastal California, is the movement to make housing a human right. And the movement to make housing a human right in, in, a, in the big picture is a loss of owner's rights and a granting of rights to tenants or to people who own leases on that property. So it's a, it's a removal of, of just literally legislated rights for people who own property and, and giving those rights or giving those benefits to tenants. It's a trend in the market here on the coast and, and, and other places, parts of the country that I think is very difficult to be a landlord. Um, and then maximum investor competition. Have, has you guys ever seen this many investors also competing? Those of you that are wholesaling and flipping, what, what do you guys see with the investor competition who've been doing it at a while? And put, put your answers right in the chat. So Janet's helping me keep an eye on the chat. Right now. It is tough. Yeah, it's. Exactly, Brian and everybody else. So we've never seen debt this cheap. So that's in our stadium right now. That's in our environment. That's the positive. A lot of the first ones Larry was talking about were the negatives. But I think that like um, Kirk was talking about at the beginning, if you were on and before the meeting started, debt is so cheap right now and everybody has money that's sitting in the bank earning nothing. So it's a really good time to get good financing. And the other thing that we have found is um, there's such a huge demand for rentals and I'm guessing everybody feels this way. But for example, we just had a property um, that was vacant in La Quinta for somebody moving out of state, which we're starting to see a lot of, of course. And within a week and a half, we had 40 showings and at least 10 to 15 applications. It's ridiculous. I mean, people are desperately looking for housing. So that is a huge benefit if you can create good cash flow rentals. It's a great time for that. Thank you. Yeah, yes, you know, a good way to look at it, the stadium right now, the way I see it, I'm not as um, naturally as optimistic as Janet is. So we're a great, great partner. We, we play off each other regarding that. So these first four things, I guess you could say is a little bit um, not optimistic for our industry. And the last two are wonderfully optimistic for our industry if we're on the right side of rentals. And so I'm gonna use this opportunity to be not optimistic because I wanna mention a few things. If you are interested in becoming a housing provider or you already are a housing provider, there's a lot of attacks on our industry right now. So I'm gonna take 20 seconds here and encourage you to remember to fight for our industry. Even if you're not um, gonna hold rentals, it's still, we're seeing a, a historic um, removal of property owner rights and, and a redistribution of health property and rights. Just for instance, um, in 2018, there was a ballot initiative, two years ago, there was a ballot initiative to put, to uh, enact statewide rent control. 70% of all California voters said, no, thank you. That initiative was squashed harder than any other ballot initiative in 2018. It just lost horribly. Well, um, in 2019, Assembly Bill 1482, 1472 passed without any choice of the populace, but all the politicians in Sacramento said, well, I know you all you people voted against property uh, uh, rent control, but we're gonna enact it anyway. So now we have statewide rent control, totally out of the hands of the people. And so remember that first initiative failed. Well, that same group, has another ballot initiative that's gonna be on the ballot in a month and a half. That's Proposition 21. So I strongly encourage you to vote against Proposition 21. Again, it'll, it probably will fail, 
but they're trying over and over to remove your property owner's rights and and uh, it's it's just scary and there's two other ones that are pretty bad too proposition 19 will reassess inherited property so let's say you happen to um let's say your mom has lived in pasadena for the last 30 years and she leaves the planet and she leaves you that house if proposition 19 passes from my understanding your tax basis on that house that you inherited from your mom will jump up to today's tax that property tax value and that could mean a quadrupling or even more of the taxes and would make it extremely difficult for you to hold on to that house that you just inherited and then finally proposition 13, um, 15 is the first initiative that's actually made it to the ballot that's attacking our proposition 13 13 um, tax protections it's the split water split split roll initiative and and it, it could really um also hammer us crazy with taxes all right so I'm, I'm digging too far in the weeds for that so let's get moving any questions oh here's some questions what's this Prop 21 is rent control. So it would put a statewide rent control on um, a lot of homes in California. I don't think necessarily that it's the full one, but here we're putting the answers in the chat. So there you go. Um, if you wanna write those down and look them up, please, please take some time, read them and vote no on these. They're very important for our industry. And, and, uh, and for housing because a lot of times I think the folks who are pushing these through don't believe what we believe and how, how it will really damage housing for all. But um, let's move on. All right, game time. So that was all just a setup. What the heck are we gonna do with these three houses? What's the play? All right, we're starting with Sungo, player number one. Um, we feel it's probably a better time to sell a house now than it would have been three years ago. And why is that, right? Values are up like crazy. And we see ourselves holding on to rentals as we age and having that take care of us in retirement. So I sure do like the idea of holding on to nicer houses and getting rid of ones that are junky or that may need a lot of work. And so this one ended up as number one on our mental list that we made of houses we want to improve or sell. And remember that nicer house I mentioned, the one on Whitewater? Well, that one came into our lives and we had the opportunity to buy it. So that got us thinking about this little junky house on Sun Gold. And we're thinking, well, maybe we can sell Sun Gold and use some of that money to buy this new one and that'll help improve our rentals that we're keeping. So that's where we're coming from on this. So the reason why we thought this was a good property to sell is because, um, when we first bought it, we bought it with tenants in place, which was awesome because we never had any vacancy and we didn't do any repairs. In fact, I believe thinking back in the last five years, the only real repair that we did is we put a new AC condenser on, you know, five grand. So over this time, this house, it, we bought it junky and it got junkier because the tenants that live in there, even though they're wonderful and they pay on time, they weren't real awesome at keeping the house nice. I know it looks pretty good from the outside, but the inside is completely different. And the other reason why this one would sell is because it's a fantastic neighborhood for a first time home buyer. And the prices in this neighborhood had jumped uh, at least 50 grand in here. So we're thinking, oh, let's get rid of it before we have to do major repairs. All right. So that's our thinking on the first move in this game. Oh, and here's yeah. what it looks like. So when we bought it, it was actually nicer than this, but over time, they just really weren't taking care of it. I mean, the flooring was ripping up. I mean, uh, the lovely pink tile, I'm sure you think might be retro and we put it in, but nope, it's pretty grimy. So do any of you guys put in the chat room if you recognize this vanity. It's got the little parts of the vanity under here and a built-in top. Do any of you guys recognize this from Home Depot? What do you think the retail is on this thing? So this is the way we bought the house. We did not put in this junky little uh, vanity. Yeah, and it's a one bathroom. And so. this is a three bedroom, one bathroom. So you have, we have a whole family in here using this one little sink. It was tough for them. Yeah, uh, Kurt, uh, I don't think it even cost 199 bucks. <laughs> it's, like, 
$50, Yeah, Curtis has 199 bucks. And oh yeah, and the soap scum waterfall. I love that, you guys. Yeah, okay, that's custom. Now that the tenants installed that feature, we we didn't put that in ourselves. All right, so let's move on. That's what it looked like. Do we have more pictures? Oh, we have a couple more. Here's the backyard. I never saw the garage door actually close all the way. I think it was dented or damaged. And um, Does yeah, any <laughs> service panel that we put in? Yeah, Brian, Old Spice. Did you see it on the last one? He's like, Look, Old Spice. Oh yeah get the ladies <laughs> and this elect that's the whole electric panel for the whole house and the meters sit next to it this is not a sub panel so um it was 1952 wiring it's just something that <laughs> at least they use soap <laughs> it's just something i was excited <laughs> to not really have to repair nice. not have to repair yeah and actually i'm not actually sure if those uh, cars were operable or not i'm guessing no it looks like it has a flat tire so you know, not the best of houses. Anyway, All right, let's roll on. Okay, we're going to come back to that. That was our player number one, remember. Player, player number two, it's back in the game. Let's talk about this one. This is that Whitewater one. Remember, I love this one. I love this neighborhood. This is what we want to improve the junkie house and end up with this house. So this is, All right, so let's move on. Let's see. So Whitewater joins a team. We came up with the idea, hey, why don't we sell the junkie house on Sungol in 1031 the profit into Whitewater, this new nicer house. Um, we liked it because it was an absolute perfect candidate. This new house was a great candidate to build an ADU. And this was just a couple of months ago. You know, we've all been excited about ADUs. I mean, last year you, you couldn't really go to an investor's club without hearing somebody talk about ADUs. It, it's, it's really a, some cool legislation. And the other thing we like that really made us excited about Whitewater is at the time, the city that this house was in, this, was, this house is in Palm Springs. At the time, Palm Springs did not require that the owner live in one of the two units if you build an ADU. Up to, uh, up to recently, it, it was up to a city to decide if they're gonna force you to live in one of the two units. And when they did that, it made it difficult for landlords or housing providers to build a second unit because the city would say, well, you better move into that one. And I, and I didn't necessarily wanna move into it. But Palm Springs never cared about that. So we like, oh, we're buying this house because we saw the layout, which I wanna show you the layout and help you identify what is a good layout for an ADU. We're gonna get that to that in a minute. So, that's some ideas regarding that. So we're talking about selling this one up here in the corner and getting into this one. And we want to 1031 the money from here to here. We got a problem. The problem is the Sun Gold house, the little junky one, it, we haven't sold it yet. And the new house, this one here, Whitewater, we have to close on it in 20 days. So if you're familiar with a 1031 exchange, what that basically says is you can sell one house and you can use the profits from that and buy a new one and not have to pay taxes on those profits. But if you sell that first one and just pocket the money, you're gonna get hard with taxes and depreciation recapture. Well, the rules basically say you gotta sell this first, the old house first. And then you have 45 days plus six months to buy your next house. Well, our problem was our next house, this one on Whitewater, we had to buy in 20 days because we got to remember we had a great deal at, on it and that seller wanted his money right away. We couldn't have asked him, hey, can you please give us two or three months while we sell this first house to get the money to buy this house off of you? He wasn't going to wait for us. So does anybody on the, any guys in the chat room know the type of, there's a special type of 1031 exchange. Do you know the type of 1031 exchange we could have done that would have solved that problem that we hadn't sold the first house to buy the second house? Put in the chat if you know. Don't everybody do it at once. Exactly. Yep, Catherine. Hey, Catherine. Hey. Yes, a reverse 1031 exchange. And Catherine, you absolutely nailed my next point. Way more expensive. So to do a reverse 1031 exchange, a reverse 1031 exchange basically means to buy your target house, the one you want, and then sell your old junkie house later. 
and then basically take that, those, that funding and bring it over to the new one that you've got. But it's tricky. So I asked my 1031 exchange accommodator company about that. And he said, yeah, we can do a reverse exchange. That'll allow you to hurry up and buy this one in 20 days. And then you can take your time a little bit to sell that other one. And I said, well, how does it work? And he says, well, our company sets up an entity like a LLC. I think it's an LLC. And you tell us which house you want to buy. So I'd say, well, set up a co corporation and go buy this one on Whitewater. And you give us all the money to buy it. And we'll never go look at it or not going to take care of it. So you have to maintain it and take care of it the whole time. And then we'll buy it and we'll own it. And then you take your time and sell that first house, the old junky one. And when you sell it, then you can come and buy this house from our corporation who's been holding it this whole time, waiting for you to sell that old one so you can raise the money. I said, well, how much does that type of service cost? And he goes, well, it's a lot of work. You know, we have to start a corporation. He says, the price starts at 7,000 bucks. And I go, okay, well, does the $7,000, does it get credited to like the purchase price of the house? You know, and of course he laughed and almost hung up the phone on me. And so that was a lot because we weren't coming out with very much money from the junkie house, the sun gold house. There wasn't a lot of equity there. There was a chunk enough, big enough for us to care about it, but it wasn't that big. And so luckily we've been to a lot of clubs and meetings like this and, and great training and we've learned a different technique for some, from very smart people. And the technique is you have a financial friend buy it. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Let's see, a financial friend. So let's say you met somebody here in this club or maybe your mother or maybe you're somebody else in your world that you trust and they trust you. Remember, our problem is we have to buy our target, but we're not ready to buy it yet. So we asked a friend that we've met in a club, just like Christina's, just like this. We met him at a club like this in Orange County 10 years ago. And we've enjoyed knowing this guy all this time, been a wonderful um, colleague. And we called him up and said, hey, I need to hurry up and buy this house to, to get a great deal. But I'm not ready to sell the original, the house um, my junkie house to pay for all of it. I said, can I buy it in your name? And he goes, what do you mean by it my name? I go, well, you buy it basically. I'm gonna give you the money, you buy the house. It's gonna just be titled in your name. And he goes, okay, well then what? And then I say, well, it's gonna be in your name and I'm gonna give you all the money. You're never gonna have to look at it. You're not gonna have to do anything. And um, once I get my old house sold, I'm gonna buy this house off of you and we're gonna put it in my name and you'll be done and we'll, uh, we'll share a beer and that'll be it. My friend, financial friend, he's been around us long enough to know that we do what we say. And luckily he had some trust in us. And he says, sure, I'll buy it. So this new house here, well, oh, too far. This is the house and we call up our friend and we gave him the money and he buys it and he owns this new house that we want. But I gave him the money to buy it. Basically, the, he has nothing to do with it other than his corporation is on title. So we decide to start acting like we own it. Why, what else would we do? We paid for it. So we, decide, uh, we decided earlier that this is a good candidate for an ADU. And an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. Basically, it's new state laws, the accessory dwelling unit laws that allow you to turn a single family home, any one, any single family home, anywhere in the state into a duplex. Basically you can add another unit. There's a lot to it. And Janet's gonna put a link to some more information for those who wanna look at it. So she's gonna put that in the chat next. So we like the idea of turning this one house into a duplex basically, or having two rental units on it. And we were hoping to find one that had a great layout for an ADU. And so I'm gonna show you why we were excited about this house and why the layout was good. So what we've learned is the cheapest way to build an accessory dwelling unit or, or turn a single house into two units is if you can do the conversion under the existing roof or next best possible is I'm partially under the existing roof and only a little bit more new roof that you have to add. And this house fell in the second category. 
So the other important thing that we've learned is where are the locations of the existing utilities? If we're gonna be adding a second unit onto this house, will the second unit live close to where the sewer line is? Will it live close to where the electrical and where the gas and where the water is? And so that's important. And then the third thing that I think is real important is how's the general layout? Is adding a second unit to this house Will it meet setback requirements, which actually have become very, very easy? And will it meet other things that the city cares about? And so we, were, we learned about those things before we went shopping. That's how when we were able to show up to this house and saw what a good deal it was, we felt pretty confident we could build an accessory dwelling unit onto it. So I'm gonna funk, uh, funk around with the computer a little bit. That's a weird word, funk around, sorry. I'm gonna, <laughs> I, well, I'm gonna fumble around <laughs> and, and the, uh, show you a different screen so you can get an idea of the layout. Mm -hmm. And actually maybe Janet will do it because I'm busy yakking and I'll show you, uh, no, you don't have to change the share at all. Oh yeah, here we go, I got it. No, 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 no you're not getting it, well, let me go. You gotta undo the share. Um, the share, cancel. Okay, I'm F11. All no, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Both of us know halfway how to do this. We, we, neither of us know 100%. All right, here we go. So, give me a th somebody give me a thumbs up or put in the chat room if you can see this floor plan. All right, good. Let's look at a floor plan. Ready? We're going to go 3D. All right. This is the front of that house on Whitewater that we've been talking about. So here's the, here's the street. I don't have the little red marker in this platform. You just, can you see my mouse? I hope you can see my mouse. Anybody tell me? Okay, yeah. you can see it, great. So here's the street, here's the driveway, garage. You come in the driveway and you walk in the front door. So here's the front door right here and you come into the main living room. And this is the existing layout. This is the as-built layout, the way we bought it. So you come in the living room, there's a kitchen here couple bathrooms, master bedroom, bedroom number two, and bedroom number three. And this house, here's the garage. Remember the garage door is right there. So you come in the garage door. And this house had this attached bonus room. There's kind of a living room right here, but it had this attached bonus room. And who thinks that I might be able to do something with that attached bonus room? Yeah, that's the goal. Exactly, Nick. So this is the as-built. This is the way we found it. And we got excited about that because we thought, hey, maybe we can bolt on a couple bedrooms back here and a bathroom. And look, here's the kitchen window. So if we're building the ADU here in this section, in that section, oh, Janet's gonna flip us around. Whoa. Ooh. It's the back of the house. Did you see what she just did? Now we flipped, our perspective is in the house behind us. So if we're building the ADU back here, show them what I'm talking about back here. Where's the ADU? We're gonna build it where she's mousing. And that ADU is gonna need electricity, sewer, water, and gas. Where's our closest connection to, to water, sewer, water and sewer, basically. Water and sewer is here on the backside of the existing kitchen. Yep. So it's about a 15 foot run to where we intend to put the new bathroom and and kitchen. And then the electricity and gas were right here on the side of the garage, which also makes it a very short run to get to the new dwelling that we want to build. Yeah. So it was ideal. Yeah, it would. So when you go into a house that exists, when you see, how often do you guys see, let's say you walk in this house, how often do you see a kitchen against a wall? It's always an exterior wall. And oftentimes there's a window just above the kitchen. How many layouts have you guys seen like that? In our area, it's extremely common. What you can almost always count on is some stuff behind that window on the outside of the house. So put in the chat room, what do you think is gonna be sitting right here behind the kitchen on the outside of the house? Asking about slope issues. Kurt, Janice, exactly right. <laughs> Rose bushes. So, uh, yeah, Catherine. So, sitting on the outside 
of a kitchen on most houses is going to be a clean out. A clean out is a sewer connection or can be a sewer connection. And Krista said water damage. Also back there is gonna be water because the sink for that kitchen is gonna be in this wall somewhere. So we saw that this was so close to where we wanna put the ADU, which is gonna go right around here. That's gonna save us some time and money. All right, so let's roll on with this. All right. That's 11. No, stop doing that. Sorry, doing it wrong. That's 11. All right, here. There we go. Right under the next one, I'll look. Yeah. Okay. Here is what we came up with. So, you guys can see this new drawing. Give me a thumbs up. Yep. You recognize it? Here's our driveway, our front door. Here's our kitchen. Well, what happened? Remember we pointed out there was a bonus room and there used to be an opening right here. Well, we close up that bonus room and we turn that into a living area and put a kitchen here. And this wall right along here used to be the back of the house. So what do we need to do? We need to pour a new foundation and add wet bedroom number one, bedroom number two, and a bathroom. And remember what I was all excited about, the sewer connection and the water behind the kitchen? Well, that's just right here. And we have plenty of slope, obviously. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, somebody asked me about slope. So um, the, the distance and the way we were able to plan this really helped a lot. And Brandy, I see, Brandy asked, did we get the original floor plan from the city for this house? No, we didn't. These plans I made just by taking a tape measure to the house and we just drew it up. And I wanted to tell you, I will put the link in the text box. This program that I'm using, it has a free level and a $5 a month level. Both of them are great value and they allow you to make drawings like this very easily. It's called floorplanner.com. I'll put the link in in just a bit. So this is what we came up with, right? Pretty simple. House number one, house number two, they're connected. All right, let's roll on. With F11, right? Nope, just go here. Oh, I think. Now F11. Whoops. All right, let's see. <laughs> All right, so we beat that to death. So let's check this stuff out. Hit the striper here. Oh, sorry. And notes. Yeah. I'm gonna put the. You guys ready to check it out? Let's check it out. See what we see what we built. All right, here's what it looks like in person. This is the backyard. Here is that bonus room sticking out from it. And what do you guys think this is going? What's what's all this wood doing here? Put in the chat. What do you think this is? The other bonus, real quick, of this house was that where we wanted to add on the ADU, the roof line happened to be going in the right direction to make it really easy to extend. So we were just able to extend the rafters and make it super simple for us. Omar, are you getting beaten up? <laughs> <laughs> we're watching. Uh, all right, let's see another picture. Yes, you are correct, Catherine. Brian, that's the new foundation. So this all here, that's the old back of the house. This is where that bonus room ended. And here's our foundation for two new bedrooms in this section, and then a new bathroom over here in this section. And here's that nice roof line that Janet was talking about. You can see how it's, it was naturally just waiting for somebody to do this. This came right off of it. All right, here it is, totally extended out and into the backyard now. You can see the bedrooms are all framed up. This is the new wall, the back of the bathroom. Here we are inside two of the bedrooms as they're being framed. And there it is, stuck it all in and done. So remember the old one finished about here, right? So we pushed on the back and added two bedrooms. What do you guys think this wall is here for? All right, so questions in the, in the uh, chat. So yes, Krista, let's start with your question. Did we do this as a junior ADU? This was the standard ADU. We did not call it a junior ADU. 
um, that fence, the answer to the question, Brian, the backyard, that is a backyard divider. So the people in the ADU get everything on the far end of that fence and the people in the house get all this space that you can see in this picture. And Krista, the, your question about the garage. So it was real interesting. This is a big learning experience for us. Um, the garage, we decided to give both units access to the garage so that they would each have to split the garage. And we did not build a separate divider or put in another garage door. And what we found was that people did not like that. They were concerned about sharing the space. So our solution was to build a divider and give basically two thirds of the garage to the main house and about one third of the garage to the ADU in their own private space. And they each had their own direct access from their units. So um, that's what we chose to do with that. And yes, we could have turned that into an ADU, but we just decided to leave it as a garage. Yeah, Kurt's right. A, a, uh, under, certain guide, under certain circumstances, now that this is two units and it has a full-size garage, we could have turned the garage into a junior ADU and literally turned this house into a threeplex. We chose not to do that. At least for now. Yeah, yeah. options. All right, let's, let's move on. We still got a lot to cover because this is a fun story. All right, player number one, remember this is a junkie house. This is the one I keep ragging on, Sun Gold. It's time to sell it. So remember we did, we bought this, the nice house with the ADU before we even realized we needed to sell the Sun Gold. That was the whole reason with our, that was the whole reason for the financial friend to help us out. He bought it and he owned it while we were getting ready to sell this. So now it's time to sell this place. All right, how do you sell a rental? So we have some thoughts on how to sell a rental. Um, I think this first one with a pizza, pizza means it's, whoops, pizza icon means that I like pizza. And the other thing it means is that um, I think it's an important thought and it's good to remember, or it's good to take into account or, or uh, take the lesson to heart. So if you think about a lot of the news headlines, especially now with current uh, situation, you hear about a wave of evictions and you hear a lot about the poor tenants that the landlords are gonna kick them all out. And being a housing provider, being a landlord, it's, it, landlords do not want to evict anybody. We want people in the houses paying the rent. You guys know this, so enough about that. So what we've learned in our career is if you, if two reasonable, sets of adults sit down at the same table and talk about the situation over and over, they're gonna come in, come up with a much, much better solution than you'll ever have if real estate agents get involved, if attorneys get involved, if a lawsuit gets involved, if a government gets involved. So treat your folks like sm the, fart, the, the smart, <laughs> I, try to say, I try to say smart, Treat your folks like the smart people they are because they're adults and they live in your house and you probably, you probably like them because they live in your house. So sit with them and come up with solutions. So I'd ask my tenant, I'd ask myself or my tenants, do you have a steady job? I ask myself, do I like them? Because if I'm considering selling this house and I'm considering selling it to the tenants that have been in there, I don't want to sell it to somebody who's going to make my journey um, uncomfortable or annoying. If they've been a problem tenant, I would not offer to sell them the house. But we love these people. Yes, we talked about how they live a little rough. That's their style. They were never malicious. They were always great. And does it make the math make sense for them? Don't offer a house to a tenant that can't afford it. We learned in 2003, 2004, and 2005 that human beings will say yes to a payment that they can't afford. And um, so you know, you should know their income or ask them their income and make sure that they can afford the payment. So let's see how this looks. You wanna do this one? Sure. So that they were paying about $1,400 in rent. And prior to sitting down with them, we checked out with a mortgage broker what you know down payment and rates would be. And although the fair market value at the time on the as is property, because remember it had jumped up in value was about 173 maybe with a couple grand of paint and stuff if they had to move out. But we decided to give them a discount because they're cool people and we'll show you the math in just a bit on the next slide on why we wanted to give them a discount. So if they put 10,000 down and they financed 155 at about three and a half percent, 
their principal interest taxes and insurance payment would be approximately 960, which clearly is a lot less than they were paying in rent. So of course somebody's gonna want to pay less and own a home if they can handle it and do it and come up with the down payment. So this was a good option for them and they were actually pretty stoked um, when Larry went to chat with them. Hey, sorry. Hey, we put in the chat box a few minutes ago links to about a couple URLs to ADUs. Did you guys get that? Because I'm make I just yes. I'm looking. Oh, okay. It looked like we were just privately texting it to somebody, so I wanted to make sure I'll, I'll, everybody got it. If they aren't at the end of this, I'll go through and make sure. All right. So sell of the tenants. Janet just so, is she did you lay this out? Yes. All right. Okay, I'm just checking back in. Sorry. All right. Let's roll. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to my world. All right, tenants versus agent. Now there's some wonderful agents in the business. Uh, I love great agents. Um, they can make you a lot of money and you can help make them a lot of money. But in this situation, I don't think a tenant was the best, uh, the best agent. Uh, agent was the best thing to go with. Get, get this one, will you? Yeah. So one of the things we, we talked about, let me back up real quick. When we sat down with Leo, and Vanessa, they were super, or excuse me, Yoli, they were stoked because when we brought up selling the house to them, I honestly, I think they just, they got super emotional. They said that when we bought it, they had originally wanted to buy the house, but they didn't think they could afford it or qualify at the time. So when we offered to sell it to them, they were really stoked and we felt good because this was giving a family their first generation in their family to own a home and they didn't have to move, they didn't have to uproot their whole family and they were super stoked. So that's my little emotional soapbox there. So selling to them, we sold it to them for 165 and they paid rent up until the day they owned it. So we never lost any rent. We didn't have any agent fees. We had zero rehab costs because they bought it as is. And of course the typical closing costs. So we netted approximately 160,000. If we had had them move out and just do a teeny little rehab, we could have done a big rehab, but why bother if you can net about the same? So if we would have sold it for 173, we of course would have had, well, That's three, months. three months at least of lost rent. So we just calculated three months. We would have paid agent fees, a little bit of rehab, same closing costs, and we would have netted about 150. So not only did we give the family the opportunity to buy a house, but we made our life a lot easier by not having to do any of the rehab, put it on the market and take our time. We were able to do it. And I think we closed in about 35 to 40 days. This was when loans were moving a little bit faster. So it was just a good deal all around for both sides. So the family, the, the tenants, the family, they um, not only does help uh, help us, and, and don't be scared to discount your price. Do you see that? We gave them uh, 8,000 bucks off the price compared to the full market value we could have got with an agent. Now, if you don't know any better and you meet a great agent, the agent's gonna say, you know what, I can get you 173, I can get you 175, and the tenants might only qualify for 160, 165, what would you do? Your answer is you get a pencil out and you do the math. Do the math. The math should make all of your decisions in this business. You can let your emotions come in after you've seen the math, whether it's selling, buying, or whatever, everything. So just do the math. Leo and Yoli, the tenants, they are the first people in, first generation in their family that ever owned a house. And, and we were just so happy to get, uh, get them in there. All right, let's move on. What do you do if the tenants don't want to pay or play? Um, you want to answer that? Brandy, Janet's going to answer. All right. Oh, I need to click. Okay. You click. We're working with one computer and one mouse, but there's two of us going. All right. If tenants don't want to play or play, remember what I said? Sit with them. Make an appointment, show up, and sit at the counter. And if you already know they're not interested in staying, I recommend you handle it this way. You're, um, you are the property owner and you do have the ability to be flexible and, but you do need to be able to um, make sure your lifeboat stays afloat. And what I mean by that is um, look out for yourself and then help anybody else that you can after that, not in a greedy way. 
So the way you, this meeting would go is if you find yourself in this situation is you'd speak very firmly and friendly and you speak very um, firmly about, or you speak about the future in certainties. Like for instance, um, I would say something along the lines of, I, uh, I have, my situation is made it that I have to sell this house. I know you guys aren't interested in buying it, but I'm going to have to sell it. So you will need to give me the house back. What works for you? And I'd listen, right? Basic, basic back and forth. They may say, you know what, we've been hating this neighborhood or we have a chance to move to um, North Carolina or who knows what, and maybe it'll work out well. If they can't go or don't wanna go, you may wanna consider bribing them. And how do you determine if you should bribe them and how do you do it? Yeah, you do the math. Somebody should be typing in the chat, chat box, you do the math to determine how much you can bribe them. I would suggest bribing, what, 10 minutes. Yes, oh, let's hurry. Um, I would suggest bribing them with um, something based on performance. So if you get the house, if they're out in 30 days, they get 2,000 bucks. If they're out in 45 days, they get $1,500 and so on. So enough, of, enough about this, you guys get it. Let's get rolling. Um, so here's how we did on that house. You wanna go over this? Sure, so real quick, we're gonna believe because we just got the 10 minute warning. So we, Borrowed 110 over, oops, over time. We ended up cash flowing approximately, just call it 330 bucks a month, give or take. And we owned it for 58 months, seven, uh, seven years, seven, uh, six, six five months, years, five uh, years, five years. Five, five years. So cash flow wise, we netted about 19,000 over those years. And from the, ten, uh, from the sale of it, we netted approximately 55 grand. So overall, over time, we earned about $74,000 on this, which is definitely nothing. It's not like the major home run, but it's a, it's a nice, good, um, solid cash flow and property that was relatively easy to manage. And we um, netted a good 55. The 55K is what we rolled into Whitewater. So the 55K, which makes it so outstanding, which somebody mentioned earlier, is it was tax-free money. Because it was a 1031 exchange, we rolled it right through the um, Exeter, which was the company that we used, and uh, that's when we officially bought the Whitewater House from our financial friend. And we bought the Whitewater House for the same exact price that he bought it for, so there was no net um, profit or loss to him. It was just a wash. Hang on, there's a real important here. So Omar just hit it. If you see what Omar just typed in the in the chat box, exactly. Who remembers? what we paid for this house. And who remembers how much money we borrowed when we bought this house? Anybody? So if we paid a hundred grand and we borrowed 110 and five years later, we profited $74,000, what would you say our rate of return is when we had nothing in the house? Yeah, zero, let's move. All right, Whitewater, this guy's back in the game. Let's keep moving. Now it's time to buy it. Remember, we finally sold the junkie one. The construction's done, the tenants are in place. Here's what it looks like. Here's the kitchen in the main house. Remember, here's that window in the sewer hookups that I was all so excited about right behind here. Here's kind of the main living room. You can see we used uh, waterproof flooring. These can lights are available on Amazon for only 10 bucks. Janet will give you the link here in a second. We absolutely love them. They go in super easy. So if you're not using these yet, check them out. I need to click on this. There you go. Great AC. Um, and now here, this has a pizza slice on it. Here is the ADU kitchen. And Janet has a couple little secrets that are gonna save you $800 to $1,500 when you build a kitchen for a rental unit. You wanna tell them your secrets? Sure, so um, real quick, over the years with our rentals, we do two times a year, we do what's called a health and safety inspection. And that's literally to get us into the property, see how the family's treating it, and then also make repairs on stuff that would cause long-term damage. And what we learned is that literally 98% of our houses and our tenants never, ever, ever use a dishwasher. They use it for storage. So we quit putting dishwashers in our rentals 
And then the other thing, two other things is Larry already mentioned is the can lights. They're super reasonable. They're LED, which really helps with electricity bills. And then we stopped putting in so many upper cabinets, right? We put in shelves and um, we've noticed that, you know, for a smaller house, not a flip, but for a smaller house, tenants don't generally care if you're missing a couple or don't put in as many upper cabinets. So it really saves quite a bit of money. All right, let's roll. Beautiful AC. Look at this guy with these nice pants here and a good ass. This is where that wall is that separates the backyards. All right, that's moving. So Whitewater is now rented. The house gets 1800 bucks. The ADU is getting $1,300. So now it's bringing in $3,100 a month. Originally, if we had left it as a regular single three bedroom, two bath house, it may have rented for about $1,600, which did not meet the 1% rule. So adding that extra ADU, what's the return on investment on that? Remember the ADU is bringing in 1,345 bucks. And when, I, when we bring in rent in our company, we set aside 10% of that rent for vacancies as a padding. We set aside 10% uh, for repairs. And about on this one, it only, the insurance is very cheap and a little bit for insurance. So this ADU was netting over a thousand bucks, basically profit every single month. So remember I said we were able to build this cheaply. It cost us about 80,000 bucks to build. And um, we were real happy with where the price came in. So if you happen to have 80,000 bucks sitting in your bank account and that you build an ADU and it generates a thousand bucks a month, you're basically earning 16 grand on your $80,000. Excuse me, 16% on your 80,000 bucks. Pretty good. So put in the chat room, how do we make it better? Who knows? I bet you Omar will know. Here's what we did. 80 grand to build it. Remember, it generates a thousand bucks in profit. We borrowed the 80 grand at 8% interest only. So we have a $530 loan payment on it. So the rents minus the loan payment means we've got $523 net profit. Who remembers how much money we put in the $80,000 ADU if we borrowed $80,000 to build it of our own money? Exactly. Nothing. 100% infinite return on investment. Just generated 500 bucks out of nowhere out of, from this house. Green Horse, finally, the house with the cloudy neighborhood comes into play. All right, let's get this moving. This one gets a little complicated, it's gonna be fun. So remember our goal was improving our rental stock and we did it. We got rid of the junky one up here. We built this one, turned it into a house with a duplex. So we're all set. Why does this one have anything to do with this story about us improving our houses? Well, let's get into it. Green Horse, there it is. Am I going the wrong way? Yes, I am. Hey. Um, why did we buy it? We knew the neighborhood does not pencil as a rental. In this neighborhood, there's a high HOA. It eats away at your rental profit. A lot of seasonal people live here. So it's, um, you can find a good tenant, but uh, it's just something we weren't interested in holding as a rental. But we're open to flipping it. And so here's how we flipped it. So when we looked at it, we figured the ARV, um, after repair value, and somebody asked for those fair market value, this one is after repair value, was about 180. We figured about 20 grand in rehab, 10 grand in holding, buying, and closing costs. And so we figured that our maximum price that we could offer was about 135. But if you recall, we knew the owner because we had worked with her in the past. We actually had sold her a home in the past. So Donna, is pretty, she's pretty funny. She's tough, um, older lady, and she was very firm at 155. So how many flippers are watching? I want you guys to put in the chat room. If you had to, if the ARV, which is what you'll sell for after it's fixed, minus 20,000 bucks to fix it, whoops, minus 20,000 bucks to fix it, plus about 10,000 costs, um, and you could buy it for a, Basically, our max offer would be 135,000. Is what I'm saying. I just did it. And the sell. Did you just do this? Yes, I just did that. Will you pay attention? Sorry. Well, well, you guys to my world. Basically, would you buy this and flip it? If these are the numbers, you know, you can pay 35. She wants 155. Would you pay 155? So, no. No. Thank you. The no's are rolling in. We said no. No, thank you. Flipping didn't work. Renting didn't work. 
Well, we're still not done. What about capturing the financing? Well, why would we capture financing on a house we didn't really even want? So this is where we might go in the weeds a little bit, but I want you to stick with me a little bit and see if we can get the idea down. I wanna ask you a question and put the answer in the chat. When you buy, a, or when a house is sold, any house is sold, does a loan on that house have to be paid off? What do you think? No, exactly. Randy, no. Janice, no, exactly. We all, a lot of us have learned that you can sell a house with a loan subject to that loan, or also sometimes called an AITB. Another version of that is a solar lease. We worked with a couple of solar leases this year. A solar lease has a lien on the house, and when you sell it, if the new buyer is fine with that lien, the lien stays. So the lien does not get paid off with solar leases. And taxes, taxes are like the ultimate super priority lien on a house. You might pay all your taxes and be all paid up this year, you just paid up for a year. The very next year, that same lien is still stuck on that house. It doesn't care. That house and that lien doesn't give a crap who owns the house. That lien is always stuck on there. So keep that concept in mind. Let's roll. So I want you to think about this. Omar knows where we're going. So if we buy this house with seller financing, can we sell that house without paying off the loan? We just figured out we could do that. A new buyer could assume it or take it subject to, but that wasn't what we wanted to do. We didn't want to lose the loan on the house because the loan I'm going to show you turned out to be amazing terms. And we wanted to take that loan and assign it to something else that we already own. And I'll tell you about that. The technique is called locking the mortgage. That's why it gets a pizza slice. So um, here's, let me explain how, how it works. You want to try explaining this? No, nope, keep going. All right, it's called locking the mortgage basically. A quick way of thinking about it is if you are a watch seller, stick with me on this, and you sell a watch to a guy on payments, and that guy now owes you 5,000 bucks, 100 bucks a month, and he comes back and he says, hey, this watch is broken. And you say, all right, well, you've been making the payments. Here's a replacement one, but you still got to make the payments on it. Nothing's changed. That's exactly what walking the mortgage is. Basically, the loan payments never ever change, it's just the collateral changes. In this case, the watch, the broken watch change for the new watch or the better watch. With a house to walk the mortgage, you take the debt off the house you're getting rid of, off the watch you're getting rid of, and you put the debt onto the watch you wanna keep, the good watch, which is gonna be that house on Whitewater. Let's roll. So the seller of Green, uh, Green Horse, the name of this house, he, she agrees to carry the financing and she agrees to carry the financing subject to other collateral. That is the term that we like to use when we buy a house where we intend to sell that house that we bought quickly, but not pay off the loan. We're going to secure that loan with a different house right from the start. Okay, Janice says I've said this five times. So we negotiate with the seller, $140,000 carry back. And she wants a thousand bucks a month. Well, this, that's a lot per month. And so I said, you know, that, that's too much per month for us to be able to handle and still give you interest and still be safely, you know, safely be able to make this payment. And still overpay for the house. Yes. We, we remember we paid that overpriced. We, we paid the 155 she wanted. We wanted to pay 130. So I said, well, we'll do it if we can do it principal only. And so put in the chat box if you know what principal only, what I mean by principal only. What is that concept? Yep. Principal only. Principal only is zero interest. So she gives us a $140,000 loan and there's no interest. Basically, I just need to send her a thousand bucks a month. So after one month, the balance is 139,000. After 10 months, the balance is 130,000. So what a principal only loan does is it creates absolutely astronomical amortization. The loan pays down very quickly. This would have done us no good if that loan was stuck to that, to this house because we didn't want to keep that house. So right from the close of escrow, the seller of this house agreed to attach this loan to this house with the ADU. It was worth a whole lot more. 
So it made sense for her to do that. And I can tell you about that in a minute if we want. So what's the difference? So we got a seven years to pay this loan back and then it ballooned. So what would it look like if, if we agreed to give her 8% interest only or we bought it with our usual investor at 8%? After seven years, the 140 grand balance would still be 140 grand. Now what if she negotiated with us and we decided to give her 5% uh, interest? After seven years, it would have paid down about 27 grand. But instead, we did interest only. So after, uh, excuse me, principal only, zero interest. So after seven years, it pays down a thousand bucks a month. So 140 after seven years, our balance is now $56,000. I like that. If you're in it for the long haul, this is a good thing. But what's it look like? Well, remember, we didn't keep this house. We remodeled it and sold it. We didn't never wanted to keep it. The only reason we bought this house was to get this outstanding, amazing zero interest loan and put it on this house here in the middle that we're keeping. So when we sold this one, we tuned it up. We thought we were gonna sell it for about 180. Well, the market's been really crazy lately. This house sold for 193 right now, this month. We got our 50, we gave her 15 grand down when we paid it. When remember we paid 155, but the note was for only 140. So we had to give her $15,000 cash to buy it. Then she gave us 140 grand mortgage. Janet put in $18,000 to rehab it, make it look gorgeous. And we had about $10,000, maybe a little less than that in other holding costs. So we earned $10,000 profit for flipping this house. Now I know there's a lot of numbers here, and it's a little crazy, but I can summarize it in by saying it this way. By buying this house and getting these seller financing terms, we got a $140,000 zero interest loan, and the person who gave us that loan paid us $10,000 for doing it, basically. Make sense? All right, let's roll. White water, remember back to here? Well, I thought we were done with this, right? Well, we're not done with it. We just got a $140,000 loan and we can now take that and put it on this house and pay it down even more. So remember the theme of this is always be improving. What got better? Did the debt get better? Our old mortgage on white water was 280,000. Well, remember we sold the junkie house and brought in 55 grand and knocked that down 55,000. We sold this this mobile home that we were just talking about and got 150,000, which was 10,000 in profit and that 140 grand note and that left a balance of 75,000 bucks. Well, that 140 note, it's not really it, it, we have to make our $1,000 a month payment. So that's a new lien. So if you add the balance of the old loan and the new loan, we knew how we now have a new loan on this house that we're keeping for 215 grand. And remember when we bought this just six months ago, it had a 280 grand loan. So in six months by doing this, we just knocked this thing down by 65,000 bucks like that. What's it look like? Dan, you wanna go over the numbers real quick? Here's some more, a deeper look at the numbers. So if we're looking at the old financing, we had 280,000. Our payment was about 1,800. Expenses, monthly expenses about 890, rents 3100. So we kept more cash flowing, which is good, 350 bucks a month. But now with our new scenario of 215, the combined payments of the first and second loan are about 1600 bucks. Expenses are the same, rents the same, but now we're cash flowing 625 bucks a month, which is super awesome. But the kicker is the amortization. So with our old loan, which was an interest only 8% loan, of course, amortization- Seven years from now. Over seven years, because our new $140,000 note, it has a seven year balloon. So we're just gonna look at the first seven years. And we're not gonna even take into account any type of appreciation that might or might not come into effect. So of course, interest only loan, there's no amortization. So if you take that 325 bucks a month times 84 payments, our cash flow over the next seven years would have been about 30,000 30, bucks. Not bad. But now, over the next seven years, with the $84,000, if 
thousand bucks a month times 84 months of amortization. The remaining balance of this is still interest only, so that does not amortize. So in seven years, our loan balance will be 144, 84 in amortization, and the 625 at 84 months is about 52,000 in cash flow. So our total profit over the next seven months will be 136. Now, most likely we'll pay off the remaining interest only loan with some better financing, but this is how it sits right now. So that's about a $110,000 difference. Learning techniques like these from good teachers at, at these types of meetings can make a difference in your lives. And this is just what we've done this year. This is, this is happening right now. So lessons. Um, let's talk about lessons real quick. We're wrapping it up. Sorry, Christine. Uh, we, what did we accomplish? Remember our goal was to take a junky house and improve it and get a better house. Well, we did that. We also improved the debt. We improved the cash flow. We improved the amortization. We improved the lives of the people that lived in that junky house. They now own a rental house. They, never, they now own their own house. They thought they were gonna rent for life. Um, learning this stuff can make a difference in you and the people around you. So those are the lessons I think. If, you could sum, if we could sum up the lessons in a single point, it's always be improving, always be improving houses, always be improving your cash flow, your debt. Uh, a big thing that I am very passionate about and it's not sexy or exciting and can be quite frankly just boring is taxes. And I spend time learning about how to improve our tax situation. And I can't tell you, especially in this environment, how important that is. So whether you're the one that's going to really understand taxes and dig down in the weeds or not, I really recommend understanding the different ways for you to improve your tax situation because that has made a huge, huge difference in our life. So, and learning taxes better is education. education. Always be improving, always be improving the people in your life. You know, it's a little hard to jettison family members, um, but you can sure be around people that you like. You know, people in these types of meetings have the same interests as you. So, just think about always be improving. That's a point. I don't need to. I don't need to beat it up anymore. What else we got? We have. Oh, um, this is an invitation for y'all to join us. Janet and I run a, a meeting very similar to um, Christine's Phoebe. It's the Coachella Valley Real Estate Investors Association. Here is the how to learn more about us. We are just hit our 12th anniversary. The club has. So um, we've been doing this a little while, and we enjoy giving back. Um, and then the other way you can support us or work with us is sell to us. We are buyers. We're active buyers and remodelers. So if you are a wholesaler or perhaps you have a home in any one of these 11 cities, this is where we work and this is where we specialize in. If you have something in these cities that you just like our opinion on, reach out. We, I, I love helping people. And if I can give you some advice and tell you, heck yeah, do it or hell no, don't do it. I'll give you my advice. You know, take it for what you will. And then if you get homes in these house, in these areas, call me up. I may be, I may be interested in buying them. So, um, and I think these types of areas, these represent a certain type of price point. These types of areas exist where you can do what we just showed you in a lot of other areas. Some that come to the top of my mind are the Antelope Valley. It's great for this type of work. Um, Hesperia, Apple Valley. I think Big Bear has, has a nice window right now to get some good values and, and um, a lot of people are moving out of cities and interested in areas like that. So lots of areas around Southern California that you could actually drive to. Now it might take a half a day to drive to. Perhaps even um, heading north up the Grapevine, those types of areas. That's it. Here's my email address. Um, thank you for your patience and, and I hope we're able to give you some value. Um, that's it. I think, it's lovely. Uh, yeah, it was lovely. Fun. Thank you, guys. That was really fantastic. And this, we need to give them a applause, or you can give them a reactions applause. And yeah. I think I think one of the things that I I want to repeat was what was just put in the chat, uh, which is, you know, that was fantastic, Larry and Janet. Thank you. You guys are always and ins always inspire me. Thank and you. I think I think that's what's important. I'm not. Those aren't even my words. That is actually in the chat box. So I want to let you guys. I'm sure you'll notice that. But I want to let you guys know that. 